your hands down just made a terrible choice. You lied in church. I don't really know what the Bible says about what happens when you do that, but I don't think it's good. Uh, you lied in church. We've all made bad choices. We've all made mistakes. We've all made just these errors in our life. Um, and and it's, it's easy for us to kind of try and not focus on those bad choices, but the fact of the matter is, all of us have made these, uh, these bad choices. Um, so the, the thing is, choices, bad or good, shape us, okay? If we're making a good choice, it's going to benefit us. It's going to be a good thing. If we make a bad choice, it's probably going to harm us. Some of those good choices and some of those bad choices will shape us more than others, right? With me, right? There we go. Good work. You guys are, you guys are coming along. I dig it. Um, so... These choices, we're faced with choices every day. Cash or credit, walk or run, I walk. Um, McDonald's or, what do you eat? Like Zahar comes up in here with like Subway for breakfast. I'm like, that's disgusting. I want a Whopper for breakfast. What? No, I don't. That's not true. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but we, all, we have choices all around us. Uh, we could take the elevator. We could take the stairs. Apparently, all of my choices that I'm using as examples are health-related. I should take note. Um, but when we talk about Peter and Judas, we're talking about some of their choices that they made. Uh, and I want to talk with you just for a moment about Judas, uh, some of the choices that, that he made. When we talk about Judas, when I ask you guys about Judas, you're going to respond with the, the baddest choice that he probably ever made, right? Like, that's how he's known. He's known as this guy who betrayed Jesus. It's a bad choice. It's, it's probably a, a silly choice to make. But I have to believe, like these choices that we make in our own lives, good or bad, Judas didn't just, like, out of nowhere make this choice, like, I'm a disciple, I'm spending all this time with Jesus, I'm going to wake up and be like, you know what? I'm going to betray Jesus today. No, like, something happened in his life. There was a progression that took place where he eventually got to a place where he was going to betray Jesus. Um, so when I, when I was thinking about Judas and I started just kind of getting ready, I, you know, I knew some things about Judas, but to be honest with you, most of what I knew about Judas was what the passion of the Christ and what, you know, this story of Easter, what kind of we focus on, you know, the, the, him betraying Jesus. And there's a couple things about Judas that, that I knew that aren't necessarily always talked about, but other things that I had no idea that, that blew my mind. Um, and these bad choices that he made, like I said, he got there somehow, right? So what I think about and how I would relate that is marriage, right? Um, the average marriage in America, in the church and outside of the church, like half of them are ending in divorce. That's like heartbreaking. But the fact of the matter is, I think that, I mean, there might be some, but very few of those people who get married walk up to the altar. We've had weddings here and like hold hands with their spouse and are like thinking at that moment, you know what? I'm going to let this ride for about three and a half years and when things go south, I'm just going to tap out. No, like, people don't think that. You know what I mean? Like, they, they have every intention when they are dating, when they get engaged, when they're planning their wedding, that this is going to be something that is going to be phenomenal forever, right? Like, I mean, most people, I think it's safe to assume that. And, and I think that in Judas's life, there are things that we can take from him uh, where I don't, I, I just want to pose that idea and that thought to you guys. I don't think he woke up and was like, out of nowhere, spur of the moment decision, I'm going to betray Jesus. There were things that happened in his life, choices he made that got him to that place. Um, so some of the things that I found out about G uh, Judas while studying, and another full disclosure, I'm kind of ADD, I'm a youth pastor, it's cool. Uh, my son's name's Judah. Um, so if I like called Judas Judah or Jesus Judah or something weird there, just bear with me. I'll, I'll get through it. Um, but that's just, that's the bottom line. Okay, so um, Judas was a treasure, okay? Judas was the treasure of Jesus' disciples. He handled the money, okay? There's an example where uh, Judas made a poor choice with this money in the Bible, uh, where, where Judas was managing the money, and, and he was looking at how the disciples, or, or it was actually not the disciples, it was how a woman was pouring something onto Jesus' feet, and he was like, this is a terrible waste of money. Like, what are you doing? And... Uh, because he's mindful of the money, right? But what happens is there, was, there were parts in Scripture where Judas actually stole some of that money and used it for his own good. Um, so he's kind of like this dark dude, right? Like, you know, he's doing good. He's, we have to remember that Judas was chosen by Jesus. 
And I think we forget that a lot. You know, we forget that, that Jesus chose all of his disciples, and Judas was one of those guys, okay? So Judah, Judah, there we go, see? Jesus saw something in Judas and chose him to be his treasure. He was good with money, made a mistake, made a bad choice, but we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, but he was the treasure. Another thing, and this is the thing that I learned that, like, blew my mind. You know, I've been raised in the church, went to Sunday school, had the felt board experiment done on me. It was awesome. Um, but, like, I know these stories about Judas. There is a scripture I'm going to share with you. It's John 6. Don't put it up yet, guys. But uh, where, where Jesus says that he doesn't even believe that Judas fully bought into Jesus' min- mission, his ministry. Okay, so a lot of these disciples early on, uh, I'll read that scripture in a second. A lot of these disciples thought that Jesus was coming to be almost a political savior to them. Okay? At the time, these people were under Roman rule, and Rome was like a dark place. It was chalked full of Pharisees. It was just people were being persecuted. There's a lot of stuff going on. And these disciples, especially Judas, thought that Jesus was coming to be the savior of that, of, like a political savior. Okay? So to hear Jesus say, at this, when I'm studying this, to hear Jesus say that he never even thought that Judas believed he was the son of God, like kind of shook me. I'm like, wait a minute. How could you not figure that out in the, the couple years you're spending with him? You know what I mean? We go through life, we go through our struggles, and we make mistakes, and, but we don't like have Jesus by us every day, right? If we're hanging out with Jesus every single day, we might doubt at times, but I feel like after a year or so, you're going to kind of figure that out, right? But Jesus says in John 6, you can put it up, it's John 6, uh, verse 63, it says, it is the Spirit who gives life, there we go, the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe, for, G- for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. So here we see that Judas, Judas's lack of faith is what led him to unbelief. So I'm going to write Judas over here. Okay. And unbelief. I before E. See what I did there? So his first choice led him, that's like kind of, kind of crazy, you're welcome, but um, it led him to unbelief. He, he decided that Jesus was going to be this political savior, and though there were many opportunities, um, though there were many opportunities for Jesus to speak to him, he never believed. He never had the faith that Jesus really was the Son of God. And what did that choice that he made lead to? Betrayal. There's our next word. Good work. I'll try and write this one a little straighter. You guys, you guys think this is messy. Wait till Matt comes up here. This guy literally <laughs> writes like a rooster. <laughs> That's mean. I love Matt. He's one of my best friends in the whole wide world. Um, but uh, So for us to see that Judas, his faith led to unbelief. Can everyone see that? Is that cool? Uh, led to unbelief. And then his unbelief eventually led to betrayal. It kind of makes sense. You know, Judas never believed that Jesus was the Son of God. So for him to betray, you know, us, fast forward, it's easy for us to understand, you know, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, it's really not that big of a deal for you to betray him. Right? But what's our symbol today? What's, what's the symbol of today's message? The rooster. The rooster in the denying, whose story is that? Peter, exactly. You guys are awesome. Um, we can understand why someone like Judas, who doesn't believe, who doesn't have the faith, who's already, we have examples throughout scripture about how he is a poor manager of money. He's already kind of led, kind of guided by evil. But the rooster and Peter, how in the world do, does someone like Peter, who, we're going to put Peter over here, but he's on the other side. He's not the one that's, deni- that's betraying Jesus, that's stealing. He's known and referred to as the rock of the church. He's the one that, of Jesus' inner circle of, of disciples. He's there. He's close. How could someone who isn't on this side, the, the led by evil side, how could someone who's good also fail so terribly? So. So. 
Some of you uh, might know I'm in a band, and I love music. Um, so I just want to start off by reading you um, a lyric. Uh, one of my favorite bands is called Fleet Foxes. They're this band from Seattle, and uh, they, I just want to read you one of the quotes from their song. It goes, If I know only one thing, it's that everything that I see of the world outside is so inconceivable that often I barely can speak. Isn't that true about life in general? There's like moments in life that we experience that can leave us totally speechless. And for us in Cleveland, it's always sports, right? <laughs> There's like this thing about Cleveland. It's like a rite of passage to say I'm from Cleveland to root for the always defeated Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Cavaliers. There's no one in America that's telling their friends, I don't know, I root for the Patriots, but now I just want to root for the Browns because I love them. No one's saying that. So if there's any moment in our lives that leaves us speechless, it's always sports. I remember this one specific time um, when LeBron was still here, and we were in the playoffs against Orlando, and we had a home game, and we were down 3-1 in the series. And if we lost, we were out. And there was a bunch of us in my parents' house all hanging out watching the game. And um, there were seconds left, and we were down by one, and LeBron was dribbling, and he just fades back and nails a three and wins us the game with the time expiring. And it's just this moment where no one said anything. We just scream and flipped out, and we're so happy, and I'll never forget the face that I saw on LeBron. It was just this moment where he was just stunned. And so, as aware as I am of moments in life that can leave us in awe of something amazing, there's moments in life that leave us in awe of something terrible. I'll never forget waking up um, the morning that I learned about the Chardon shooting, and I was just, remember how shook I was to my core that something so terrible could happen to such innocent children. And so, as aware as I am of the good things in life that leave us speechless, there's also bad things. And we kind of get a picture of this when we look and have a conversation about Judas and Peter. You know, Judas did this terrible thing, and and we're just left speechless by it. And um, Peter did some amazing things that we're left speechless by. So I want to talk about Peter a little bit. Peter, I'll write Peter up here to start. This may look bad, and uh, probably will. I'm sorry. But it is the English language, I promise. (laughs) And um, so Peter was a fisherman. He was a big burly dude that was used to being out on the ocean, and uh, he left all that behind to follow Jesus. And uh, he was the, the kind of dude that kind of wore his emotions out on his sleeve. Um, whatever kind of came into his head came flying out of his mouth, and he usually ended up with his foot in his mouth. I know that has been me a lot in my life. I've spent a, more time being happy with what I said. I, meant, I spent more time trying to pull everything back that just came out of my mouth and putting it back in. But, so I feel like Peter sometimes. But he had a heart that was full of love, and he understood who Jesus was and he was able to engage in, in his weakness. And for that reason, he was the leader of the disciples. And he was one of only three people that Jesus considered his close-knit group that, that he would teach. And um, we're going to see here as we talk that his choices were the result of his understanding of Jesus. So I want to look at some moments where we're left speechless by who Peter is, by what Peter did. And um, so I wanted you to go with me to the scriptures. Open up to Matthew 14. If you have your iPhone or your Bible, whip it open. If not, it'll be up on the screen in a minute. Not yet. And uh, we, we see this moment in time where Jesus had just fed like 5,000 people. And uh, he wants some time by himself. So he sends um, all the disciples out on a boat onto the sea. He goes up into the mountains and prays, comes back down. And he sees the, the boat on the sea. And uh, it's too far away to communicate with. And the waves, the waves are crashing and the wind's blowing and there's a storm. And uh, so this is where we meet um, the story. Read with me in, in chapter 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And I love this moment in Scripture because it always makes me laugh. So there's a bunch of dudes on a boat, strong, burly men that are just stricken by fear. And Jesus almost calls out their manhood by saying, take heart, basically to say, have some courage. Like, it's going to be okay. We've all been in this experience before. It's me. Don't fear. And so naturally, Peter being Peter, he doubts. So the next line says, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, as if nothing that just happened is convincing enough, command me to come out on the water to you. And I love this part because for me, I'm looking at Peter and just thinking like, dude, how do you not get this? Like this dude that you are following, you know personally is walking on the water. He just said it's him. Like for me, I'm just like frustrated reading this story. But the cool thing about Jesus is that he'll never ask you to do anything 
against your will because he's such a gentleman. And in this moment, it's not until Peter beckons him to call him out on the water that he says, with all the patience and love and, and understanding in the world, he just simply says, come, as if he's just been waiting for Peter to buy in. So he says, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got on the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. See, this moment is the definition of who Peter is. He's a man of big faith and big doubt. And to his credit, I don't think anyone else is going to get out of the boat. Only Peter would. But if anybody else did get out of the boat, I'm pretty sure none of them would have sank into the ocean. Only Peter was capable of that. And um, so he's walking on the water, and everything's all good for a minute, and he has doubt, and he loses his faith, and he starts to sink. And Jesus, is, Jesus introduces us to a moment um, that runs throughout his ministry. Whenever Jesus is healing people, and he's, he's healing people who are sick, he always says, go, because your faith you have been healed. Because you chose to believe you have been healed, go and sin no more. So we get this glimpse of Peter catching on to what that is and who Jesus is. And he steps out in faith, and he chooses to believe. Better than I thought it was going to look. I'm happy. <laughs> um, so he chooses to believe, and, um, but at the same time, he also doubts. And so they got into the boat and they worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. I love that a true experience with God results in worship. It's the act of creating art and music to worship God. That's so amazing. So jumping ahead two chapters to Matthew 16, um, we're coming into a time where the disciples are traveling. And, and Jesus knows at this point in the story that he's going to do some amazing things. But he's got to know that everyone that's with him is totally bought in. And so he kind of stops them while they're traveling, and he decides that he wants to say and ask them who they think he is, um, which is strange to me because literally we just read about how they got on the boat, worshipped him, and said, truly you are the Son of God. But it's almost as if Jesus was saying, like, outside of that emotional experience, I need to know who do you, who do you choose to say that I am. So jump with me in at chapter 13, Matthew 16, chapter 13, or verse 13, I'm sorry. He asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter simply replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, finally we see a moment where Peter is able to throw his doubt to the side and choose to believe. So Jesus responds and says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. But the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See, it's a point in time where there was nothing else that mattered except for what you chose to believe in that moment. Have you ever had that time in your life where everything just seems to fall away, and all you can say is, I choose right now to follow Christ? Because I know that the love that Christ has for me is all that matters. And serving him is the only thing that matters. Peter finally got this moment. And Jesus meets him in that moment and gives him a hope and a future. And so if you just pause the story right here, you have to think to yourself, Peter's got it going on. Because in the next moment, Jesus takes this whole thing to the next level and he predicts his death and resurrection. And right after that, he takes Peter and only two other dudes up on the mountain and reveals himself in the transfiguration. So you have to be thinking to yourself, Peter's got it going on. He finally figured out who Jesus was, and he's going to be the rock of the church. Like, how could this end in anything but something awesome? But what's our symbol today? The rooster. It all ends in denial and betrayal. You see, when it mattered most, and Jesus was looking at, or Peter was looking at Jesus in the temple being persecuted, he had to choose right then, am I going to go with my friend, my savior, the person I chose to follow and die, or am I going to get out of here? And he chose to get out. Not once, but three times, which is way worse than once. Three times is terrible. And um, <laughs> that just like always strikes me, you know. It's like, it's one thing to be like, yeah, it had just happened one time thing, it's not that big of a deal. And it's like, and then it's like, you can imagine Jesus asking him, like, so was it just once? That no, was three times. Oh my gosh, so much worse. <laughs> so, but the thing here that's strange to me is that Judas 
never bought into who Jesus was, and the result was betrayal. See, but Peter was always the first person to believe who Jesus was and buy into it, but the result was still betrayal. Why is that? I think part of it is because the good things we do in our life, the choices we make that are good, and the beauty in our life does not gain us salvation. The good things and the beauty and the right things in our life are a result of our salvation and redemption to God. And that's the difference here is that Peter was able to understand who Christ was and engage his weakness. Judas was too prideful to do that. See, what Peter understood and what we need to understand as people is something about what the power of betrayal is. This moment in their life was possibly the weakest moments of both of their lives. Because what is betrayal if it's not a moment of weakness? What we need to understand as people who choose to follow Christ is that the true power of our betrayal is that in our weakness, God's power is made whole. What, what we need to understand here is that in order to make Christ, to be made new in Christ, that's what happens when we, when we accept him into our life. We're, we're made new in him. We're giving a new life, a new birth. In order to be made new in Christ, the true power of betrayal is that in our weakness, God's power is made whole, like Matt shows, okay? But so we have Peter, and it doesn't make sense. That confuses us. But back to Judas, he was stuck in this way of thinking, this pharisaical way of thinking, if you will. Remember, he thought, and some of these other disciples thought, that Jesus was going to be some sort of a political savior, okay? So it reminds me of this story in John 8, uh, John chapter 8, verse 3. Um, it's this story where there's this woman and she's caught in adultery, and that's where we'll pick up. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst, in the midst they said to him, teacher, talking to Jesus, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. So let's get this visual here. We have this group of guys who are caught up in the law, okay? And, and they're living life to... to Please God, okay? A lot of times when we refer to this law, we act as though these guys, this law is terrible. Like, no, this law is set up to make them as close to God as possible, to make God as proud of them as possible. These rules were set up in their mind, fully believing that the obeying of these rules would make them closer to God, okay? So that's what's going on, and, and Jesus just sits there and like kind of bends down, and he's just like, What's up, guys? It just starts like drawing in the sand. And it's like this visual where like Jesus comes and, and they're trying to catch uh, Jesus into this like kind of confusion type of what, what are you going to do? Like a, kind of like a catch 22. And, and Jesus starts drawing in the sand. He like kind of hits pause and like starts drawing in the sand. And he says, um, where's the drawing in the sand part? It's the problem of stopping reading. Uh, verse 7, it says, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with this woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on sin no more. So, Jesus catches these people in kind of this place where they think they're going to catch Jesus, but he sits there and is like, dude, you've messed up too, man. And they don't really understand that because this rule that they're trying to follow is in the purpose of it is to make God proud of them, essentially. But what happens is that their failure, okay, this, these two guys' failures, they're on the opposite side of the equation, one, it's obvious. We understand why he would fail. This guy was on, on his high horse. He was Jesus' best friend. He was the guy in the close-knit circle and betrays him three times. 
You see, what I know to be true about Jesus is that he will never use your weakness to make you feel powerless. Let me say that again. He will never use your weakness to make you feel powerless. Jesus will take your weakness and he will, he will make you whole through him. Religion and, and how we sometimes, if we're really brutally honest with ourselves, will be the one who takes our weakness and makes us feel powerless. We will look at someone and we will say, oh, they're, I, mean, I do this. You know, we sit there and we put ourselves in a corner and we say, you know what, like, oh, that person, they're pretty weak, they've failed, whatever it is, you know, fill in the blank with their failure. And they will look at their failure and say, their weakness has rendered them powerless. But that's not at all what happens when Jesus is brought into the equation. It's important, there's a scripture that I want to share with you. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, my, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Judas was too prideful allow, to allow Jesus to make him powerful. But Jesus' goal for all of us is to take us from engaging in our pride and engaging in our weakness, and from there, he can make us strong, new, and free. So, we fast forward past Easter in this story real quick, and we're to a point where Jesus died on a cross. He was dead for three days, and he was raised from the dead, okay? What happened to Judas? He hanged himself. He felt horrible. He tries to go, and then it's actually hanged. It really is. I got in a fight with my students, but it's not hung. You, your coat was hung. You were hanged. It's weird. But... uh Judas took his own life. He acted impulsively. When he failed, when his weakness overcame him, he acted impulsively and took his own life. When Peter failed, they were both in their weakest moments in their life. But, but Peter didn't act impulsively and, and take his own life. Peter, he was feeling bad, I'm sure. I'm sure that he was going through this season where he felt terrible and was so discouraged. But there's this, there's this piece of scripture when we go forward, when these, uh, Mary comes back and she's looking at the tomb where, where Jesus was buried and the stones rolled away. And an angel appears to her and says, it's okay, don't worry. Jesus has been raised from the dead, woman. Take it easy. He's fine. But then there's something that he says that is so amazing. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter. He calls Peter out by name. He could have just said, go tell the disciples. Peter was a disciple, but he knew that this person, this doubter, this guy, Peter, who just like was discouraged and just let his weakness take over, and he knew that they needed to go after him. This angel tells them, go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is risen, he's alive. So they go out and they're doing this thing and they're going to find him and eventually they come and they find Peter and the disciples and tell him and it's amazing and that's where our church, the early church has kind of started. Peter's the rock of the church. How many of you, this is a second chance to respond, how many of you know how long Jesus was on earth after he was raised from the dead on Easter before he ascended to heaven? 40 days. 40 days. 40 days from now is like May 16th. That's like... I don't even want to think about May 16th. You know what I mean? How many of you are with me? You, like, you can't even think about tomorrow. Like May 16th seems so far away. 40 days Jesus was on earth before he was ascended into heaven. Now, I have to believe that if, if Jesus is going to have this angel say to go after Peter, to tell Mary to go after Peter, I have to believe that he's going to also go after Judas if he hadn't acted so impulsively. So, are we, we're kind of left when we have this rooster. This rooster, you know, to us, it's meant to remind us of this, this failure, Peter denying Jesus. But I think this rooster can mean something more to us. I think that this rooster can represent that all of us, whether we've bought into Jesus' grace, whether we've bought into believing that Jesus truly is the Son of God, or not, that we need God's power equally. That our weakness is what allows God's power to come into us and to reveal to us who He really is. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is, uh, before we pray, I'm going to have the worship team come out, and they're going to play a song for you guys. 
Um, and we'll pray to close after this, but this song, I, I want you to just kind of reflect on the song. The lyrics will be up, um, and this is just kind of a, a moment for you guys to reflect on this idea that, that where are you? Maybe some of you are in here and you're like, man, I have no idea if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I've prayed to him. I've called out to him. I've done fill in the blank to try and have this experience with him. Maybe you're here. Or maybe, maybe you've served Jesus your whole life and you've claimed that he is the Son of God and you believe that with all, all of your heart. But the result was the same for both of these, these guys. Peter's holiness, if you will, his being a good Christian didn't stop him from failing in his moment of weakness. It takes us to turn to Jesus and to let Jesus come into our hearts, come into our lives, and entirely invade everything about our lives before our weakness can bring glory to Him. So let's just kind of take these next few moments uh, and just reflect on this song, and then we'll come up and we'll close in prayer.
Jesus, we just thank you so much for setting us free. We thank you so much for making all things new in our lives. God, I pray that you will help every single one of us, Father. Embrace our weakness, Jesus, so that we can be made free, so that we can be redeemed, so that we can be made strong. And Jesus, after we do that, God, I pray that you will equip us and ready us, Father, and prepare us so that we can help others, God, so that we can help equip others and and help share your love with others, Father. Jesus, I pray specifically right now for the person, God, who maybe doubts, maybe doesn't believe. Jesus, I thank you that that same weakness that they have, us who do believe struggle with as well. And Jesus, together we need to understand that in our weakness, in our weakness, Jesus, your name can be glorified. Help us to not be prideful, Lord. I pray that you will speak to us, Jesus, in ways, Father, that will just begin to set us free from our old ways of thinking, God, that we will be a a group of believers, Father, whose love for you is so contagious that we take it with us, Father, and we go and our love, it, it transcends just for our love for you, God, but it transcends the walls of these church, God, and we can share it with others as well. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the cross, God. We thank you for the Easter story that your cross was a perfect sacrifice for us. And Jesus, I pray right now that you will just speak to every single one in this room, Father, that we will understand your love in a new way. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, we are going to have uh, some prayer partners up at the altars. Um, we are go- you guys are dismissed. We're going to, um, if you want some prayer though, some of the pastoral staff will be up here to pray with you guys. Um, but just go this week and just know that we're on a level playing field. We're all weak. We've all made mistakes. But isn't it amazing that we serve a God who uses those weaknesses and despite those weaknesses still speaks to us and uses us? I think that's amazing. So, You guys are amazing. We love you. Have an amazing week. And if you need prayer, come on up.